Good morning, West Portal, once again. It was towards the end of her life, Mother Teresa was interviewed on television's 60 Minutes by a well-known journalist, Dan Rather. And in the interview, Dan Rather asked her, he said, so when you pray to God, uh, what do you say? To which Mother Teresa responded, I don't say anything, I just listen. And it wasn't the answer that Dan was expecting. Some awkward silence hung in the air, but he's a professional and he recovered quickly and he followed up. Okay, so when you pray to God, what does he say to you? And Mother Teresa's response was, he doesn't say anything, he just listens. And more awkward silence hung in the air and then she followed it up and she said, and if you don't understand that, I can't explain it to you. Uh, we've been talking about prayer here in the new year, and I think what Mother Teresa was hinting at is a type of prayer that moves beyond words to just simple, loving presence with someone else. So the series that we've been just kind of opening our year with here has been built on the idea of what it means to apprentice in the way of Jesus. And prayer has been the one uh, discipline or practice that we've chosen to emphasize and explore what it would look like to, to apprentice in the way of Jesus when it comes to prayer. And we've, well, it's not a straight linear progression. I would never try to suggest that. But we've tried to create uh, four Sundays exploring different facets, different aspects of prayer. Some will be more familiar with, some less. And so we began with talking to God. And we looked at what it means, especially if you're new to the idea of prayer, what it means to use pre-written or pre-scripted prayers, of which like the Lord's Prayer becomes a great example, uh, using something that's already written as a way of carrying your heart towards God. As you grow more comfortable with this, you can start to kind of, a musical term would be to riff off of that. You don't have to just watch the notes on the page. You can start to feel it and play like you can in conversation. And so you talk with God. We looked at areas of gratitude, being able to express thankfulness for things that are good in our life, petition, holding up requests, inviting God to meet needs in our lives. We also talked about lament, which is something we rarely talk about, but holding up to God, if you will, that which is wrong in our lives, that which seems wrong in our world, and saying, God, I know you care about this. Do something about this. And then, uh, so both of those opening two um, facets of prayer are very one directional in the flow of communication. It's us saying something to God. And so last Sunday, we switched gears a little bit, and we opened up a conversation of what it might look like to listen to God in prayer. And I don't know how many of you tried that. We were uh, encouraging you, and we, we talked about some of the concerns and checks and balances and all of this. I'm guessing if you did this, and uh, we were encouraging you even just with your Bible reading to pause afterwards and just actually dare to write what you sense God might be speaking to you. It's a strange exercise if you haven't done it before, very foreign to us, but I'm, I'm a fan of it, and I don't like journaling. I'm a fan of it because, A, it's a constant reminder to me that God speaks. It's a constant reminder to me that when we were in John chapter 10, that you and I can learn to distinguish the voice of our shepherd through time and through repetition, through practice. And thirdly, as we start to actually become convinced, you know what, maybe it's possible that we can hear the voice of God. I find that I live with a greater level of expectancy in my day-to-day -day life, watching for where he might be at work and moving in and around me. Now, candidly, if last week was already a little stretching and threatening, I don't know what you're going to do with this Sunday. So uh, it is what it is, but we're going to talk about this idea of just being with God without needing to use words. Now, here's where, as strange as that'll seem, let me say this to begin. On a human level, you can often gauge the intimacy of a relationship by how comfortable either the friends or the couple is with being together without having to say anything. I remember when I first started to date, so back in like my late high school and early Bible school days, and I remember the anxiety that, that anticipating a date would create. And one of my primary concerns, if I'm just bearing my soul here, one of my primary concerns was what happens if there's that awkward silence? What if we're sitting across the table and we don't have anything to say to each other? Like, that'll be awful. And so sometimes, and I'm a pretty good conversationalist, but sometimes I, I would prep. I'd like, what are two to three great conversation starters or good inquisitive questions I have in my back pocket that I can just pull out in case we find ourselves in one of these awkward moments? 
And I wish I could pinpoint this. I can't, but I remember one of the first times Sean and I, we were in the car. I think it was a highway drive. And I remember it dawned on me. It had been like 15 or 20 minutes since anybody spoke and it hadn't felt awkward. And I remember this huge sense of relief washing over me going, our relationship has gotten to the point that I don't have to like perform verbally all the time and we can just be comfortable with each other. Now, I, I share that as, as uh, it's a little bit anecdotal, but if this is true on a human level, might it be true in our relationship with God that being with God and, and a facet of prayer that we would rarely talk about can actually involve just sitting in God's presence that doesn't have to busy it up with words. Now, this has been called all sorts of different things over the years, and I will use these interchangeably as I talk this morning. Uh, there would some, be some that talk about, like, a, I would talk about looking at God. Uh, you could talk about Christian meditation, a beholding prayer. Some would call it a contemplative prayer. Uh, at, at some point, what you call it matters less to me than what we mean as we look at it. So, if you have your Bibles, actually, the, first, uh, the passage, and I'll just reference some in passing this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is where I want to start. Backdrop to this passage, uh, Paul, our author, is borrowing imagery from an Old Testament story that's found in Exodus 34, if memory serves. And I need to just give you a, a snapshot of this backstory. So Israel has been rescued out of slavery you know, from in Egypt. They're in the wilderness. God is in the process of shaping and forming them into a nation. Uh, and he speaks to them during this season of their life through their leader, Moses. Now, Moses has just trekked up Mount Sinai, and he spent 40 days in the presence of God. And one of the unusual requests that Moses has made of God at this time period is, God, show me your glory. Let me see your glory. To which, and, and the text isn't like 100% clear, but God, God essentially says, well, nobody can see my face and live. So, no, but here's what I can do for you. He says, yeah, I could kind of put you around this corner of a rock. I'll let my glory pass in front of you. You can kind of look once I'm past. I don't know what it means to see the back of God. But this is uh, the heartbeat of the story. If you look at later scripture, it actually says Moses spoke with God face to face. Not literally, but it's as intimate an encounter with the presence of God and his presence and his glory as we find anywhere throughout the pages of your Old Testament. Now Moses, after 40 days of being in God's presence, comes down the mountain and his fellow Israelites start to backpedal from him. And because what Moses doesn't realize is his face has become radiant. Uh, there's this like science fiction like ethereal glow to it and it's creepy and it's freaking people out uh, and it, it it's one of this confirmation that he's been in god's presence right he's he's caught this sense of god's glory and it's being captured in his face and so the passage talks about moses puts a veil over his face it creeps people out less and over time the glory fades and he goes back up the mountain and he visits with god some more and he comes down and people are creeped out again and it's just it's a strange passage i'm just acknowledging that but paul picks up this language and this imagery okay Okay? And he puts his audience, which is fellow believers from the church in Corinth, and he, you would expect he'd put us in the shoes of the Israelite audience, but he doesn't. He puts us in the shoes, I mean, sandals might be the better expression, but he puts us in Moses' position when he makes the following. Do you have that verse for me, Sarah? But we all, with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Now leave that up for a minute. That's the NASB, actually, which is a more literal rendering from the Greek, and I do that on purpose. The NIV doesn't render this one particularly well. The word looking here is it's a Greek word, it's kataptrizo, and it means to, to gaze at, to direct the gaze of your heart. Quite literally, if you look up like Young's literal, it'll say to behold. Uh, you could use a word like contemplate, but this is often the ground zero verse for the idea of beholding God. Now, let me paraphrase what Paul seems to be saying. As believers, through the Holy Spirit, you and I have the ability to gaze at the beauty, the presence, and the glory of God. It's not face-to-face -face like it will be one day uh, when we're resurrected, right? The, the book of Revelation closes differently. But in the meantime, it's an indirect glimpse at this glory. And as we behold God's glory, it begins to have a transformative impact on who we are, on our thoughts, on our attitudes, on our character. The more we look, the more we discover we're changed. 
And it's, it's an unusual kind of a way to think about it. And the, the great question is, so how do we gaze at the God we cannot see? Good question. We'll come back to that. But this is ground zero, at least for this idea, that it's possible, and so I'll just talk about three facets, if you will, three aspects of what this wordless prayer often conveys. One is this idea of directing, I'll say, the gaze of our heart and the thoughts of our mind on the presence of God. So this looking at God, looking at you in love. I actually found, I was thinking about this as Dave was sharing a bit about the God who delights in us and our delight back in God, capturing part of exactly this idea. So, aspect number one of wordless prayer, directing the gaze of your heart in God's direction, if you will. Aspect number two is sometimes talked about as yielding. Uh, Two ideas behind this. In some types of prayer, so intercession and petition, there's a, in some ways we're wrestling with God to change what is, right? God, I need this job. God, I need you to heal my friend. God, I need you to meet me. We're we're wrestling with God to change our circumstances. There's a time and a place for this. But another facet of prayer involves learning to yield to what is coming to us also from the hand of God. I was thinking it's not worded in the form of a prayer, but we find this a little bit in Job's story. Not a happy story. And Job's wife is actually saying, like, you should really be done with God. Look at all the misery that's coming on you. And Job's response is, but I've accepted blessing from the hand of God. Why should I not also accept hardship, adversity, and suffering? Uh, This is captured, by the way, really pointedly in the opening lines of the serenity prayer, if you dabbled with that at all in the scripted prayer section. Right? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Strangely hard for us. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. This is part of a facet often of wordless prayer that involves not just wrestling to change what is, but a settling that's willing to yield, to accept what is coming to us from God's hand. The other aspect, and these are interrelated, has to do with surrendering to God's will. So this past week, my wife's devotions, she sends me this link. She's like, my devotions, I've got like seven Hebrew words every believer should know. And I'm like... That's so nerdy. Like, what kind of devotions are you into? It was awesome. And so I learned something this week because of this that I share with all of you. Did you know, I'm guessing the answer is no, the primary Hebrew word for prayer in your Old Testament is tefillah. Now, when you and I use the word pray in English, we usually mean to ask or to beg, right? I pray that. I'm asking for something. But the primary word in Hebrew, tefillah, doesn't mean to ask or to beg. It, like, literally, it's awkward. Literally, it means to execute judgment. And it sounds hostile and judicial. But practically speaking, here's what it's saying. It means to think critically, reflectively, introspectively, in an evaluative way that asks the following question. And, and God, are there areas of my life that you want to do something in and with that I need to surrender to you? If I could give you a picture of this, I would draw it from Isaiah chapter 6. I don't know if you're familiar with this story. I'm referencing all sorts of weird Old Testament stuff today. You can look it up. You're welcome. Isaiah catches this vision of the glory and the throne room and the presence of God. Do you remember? What is the first thing as he starts to realize he's in in God's glorious presence that, that comes to his awareness? Do you remember? Oh, goodness. I'm a sinful man with unclean lips. He suddenly becomes aware of all the places where God's holiness and glory are not like his life and his expression. In wordless prayer, friends, as we sit in the presence of God, you and I will often become immediately aware of those areas where our thoughts, our attitudes, and our behaviors are out of sync with who our God is. And it becomes an invitation to ask whether we're going to to hang on to these or whether we will release and surrender them. Third facet of wordless prayer involves just this idea of resting in God's presence. Speaking of crazy things that I learned this week, Orthodox Jews prohibit intercessory prayer on the Sabbath. By which I mean there are some types of prayer, I was saying before, that feel a little like work. We're wrestling with God to change what is, and they're like, that feels a little too much like work. I think that's illegal on the Sabbath, so you can't do that. Now, you can argue that's a little too legalistic. That's fine. I just found it fascinating that they differentiated between this wrestling in prayer and something maybe a little different. Now, the Sabbath is God's gift 
right? And we'll say this repeatedly, work is a good God-given gift. It really is. But God also gifted people with this Sabbath rest. Why? I think for a handful of reasons, and we could talk about practical ones, but to remind us that our work is not what ultimately defines us and that there are things in life far more important than just what we do. And the heartbeat of this Sabbath is resting in and with God's presence. Uh, In fact, the language of Genesis is God moving into the neighborhood with his creation. And I want to suggest to you, wordless prayer has the idea of being a portable Sabbath. That for a few minutes, you can pause and you don't have to busy your time with words. And you can instead allow yourself to rest in God's presence. Now, this feels horribly unproductive to us. Right? I can see heads nodding. Excellent. I'm going to assume this is a foreign idea. Now, bridging a little bit, something I mentioned a couple weeks ago. Spiritual formation is not so much a Jesus thing as it is a human thing. All of us are being shaped and formed all the time. The only question is, what is shaping and forming us? All right? Now, here's where... (laughs) Yeah, hui hui tan. So Singaporean writer stumbled across it this week. You are what your mind looks at. You are what you contemplate. Now, if I give you an English equivalent that you will be familiar with, I would say we have an expression that goes, you are what you eat. Right? And we understand that this expression goes beyond just physically what we put in our mouths. Uh, you eat unhealthy food, your body starts to reflect an unhealthy lifestyle. But intuitively with this, we also go, you are what your eyes are taking in, you are what your ears are listening to, you are what your mind is focusing on. You show me somebody who spends hours a day watching angry political news, it bleeds over in the character and conversation. You show me somebody who spends hours you know, on Instagram and social media, I'll show you somebody who's inherently self-conscious, anxious, Uh, emotional. It it just, it bleeds over into our life. You spend hours every day watching indiscriminate like television and violence or sexually explicit stuff. You tend to find people who become lustful and impulsive and we can't help this. We are what our minds look at and focus on. And while the language is um, expansive and diverse, if I leaned into scripture, you will find this idea strewn throughout. So if I said, how do you and I find some of that internal stamina for the hard walk and road of life? Hebrews 12 says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Literally? Well, we can't. So it has to mean to direct the gaze of your heart and the thoughts of your mind in that direction. Colossians chapter 3, this is the Apostle Paul, says, set your mind on things above, in contrast, not on earthly things. My favorite translation of that is, let heaven fill your thoughts. Why? Because what you think about, where you orient your mind, you find your life starts to walk in sync with that. We could go to our Old Testament. I didn't put it up there. The language is usually used of meditation. So Joshua chapter 1, I feel like this is Moses' like farewell speech to his successor. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Your life is going to set, like you're going to find you live with greater success um, and in sync with what God has asked and invited you to do. And the author of Psalm chapter 1 picks up this exact language. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Psalm 1 contrasts a godly life and an ungodly life. And the image of the godly life is that of a tree, deep root system, right? Can withstand the storms of life. It's fruitful. It's impactful, influential. And the answer is, this is someone who meditates on God's law day and day. Night, And we could go to Philippians chapter 4, which is just a general finish to his letter to that church. Paul just says, and I'm summarizing, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, whatever is praiseworthy, think on such things. Why? Because intuitively, you and I are impacted way more than we would ever care to admit by where we focus the gaze of our heart and the thoughts of our mind. Now, let's make this practical. How on earth might we do this? And here's where I will ask for, oh, I know what I wanted to do. I need to, I I didn't table this at the outset. I have 
been given books on this in the past. Of There are conservative uh, Christian circles, I don't mean this negatively, that any time you say contemplative prayer, immediately go, new age practice, run away. So I just want to table the concern and give you three reasons why I at least think we should ask what people mean when they use, use these words, and I'll give you three reasons why I think what I'm talking about is different than an Eastern mystic type of reflection, meditation, and otherwise. So this is a short answer, and we can have a longer conversation about this. Answer number one, the, the direction of New Age meditation is inward. It is to find your true self or the God within. The focus of biblical meditation is external. It is on the creator and the sustainer and the giver of life. Very, very different orientations. Secondly, the focus of New Age meditation is on emptying yourself. The, the heartbeat of it is, if I could just shut my mind off and down, that's when I will finally encounter truth. It's not a Christian form at all. Uh, we would say, in fact, it's not an emptying, but a filling. We said last week, uh, you and I can have the mind of Christ through the Spirit. God speaks to us through the mind. You don't want to shut it off. This is a primary way that God speaks. You want to fill it with Scripture and with attributes of God's truth and, and aspects of his character. As we orient our thoughts specifically on these things, that's what starts to have, if I'm going back to 2 Corinthians 3, this ongoing transformative impact in our hearts and lives. Uh, and the other thing or contrast I would just make is New Age meditation, the, the end result tends to be on a spiritual experience. Uh, whether that's a high, or you finally get lost in nothingness, that would be more of a Buddhist idea, or you finally, your spirit guide comes to visit you. It's on something usually a little bit sensational and experiential. I want to say that like, I don't know what happens as you and I meditate like on Christ and his love, and the Bible's full of visions, dreams, and all sorts of extraordinary stuff. I don't want to limit it, but the point is character uh, transformation. The point is becoming more and more Christ-like, not having some kind of a sensational encounter. So while I would use words like beholding and contemplation and uh, meditation very interchangeably, it's worth a good conversation. I think what I'm talking about, while similar, and we would expect this, there are other faith traditions that pray, there are other faith traditions that worship. It doesn't mean the practice itself is wrong. It just means we have to think critically about what a Christian focus for this might be. I think we're talking about something very different. Transition, application. Ty, Jacinda, these are my guinea pigs for the morning. Uh, I gave you sort of a choice, but thanks for being generous and for agreeing to do this. Now, let's put you guys on this side of the stage. Yeah, each of you can take a, a seat on the stool. Here's what I wanted. I wanted to give you a visual of what this is from a human perspective, and it's equally weird. So I was watching, I was watching a Netflix show this past week, and this couple was doing what they called an intimacy exercise, and it was weird, and it got me thinking, because I thought, this is perfect. And I'm Googling this, and I found a relationship coach. You get, you get some real, by the way, intimacy for couples, I am not licensed, uh, but I will give you a suggestion this morning for anybody that wants but what was fascinating, it was, it was a wordless exercise that's so weird. And I wanted to give you a, a human physical representation of this. So the idea is this. Yep. Sit like with your knees basically touching. I'll leave you the idea of uh, it's your option whether you want to hold hands or not. These guys have been married about a year and a half, so still a little bit newly weddy in this idea. So this might be, I don't know if this is less or more weird for you. And the exercise is this. I'm going to talk about three hurdles to this kind of wordless prayer, but they, they, they layer very much with this kind of an exercise. And what I want you two to do is to gaze into each other's eyes without saying a word. <laughs> you can blink, that's, that's okay. <laughs> this is an intimacy exercise. So the, the, the website called this soul gazing. And he said, you'd be amazed in the midst of the hurry and the running around and the disconnect that spouses can feel, even doing this for like three minutes a few times a week can have a, pro a profound impact in feeling seen, feeling less rushed, and feeling more connected. At least that's what I was told. We'll ask them later on how they feel about it. But it's awkward, and just the idea of sitting and gazing into somebody's eyes feels really strange if you can't fill the space with words, which is why I wanted to give you a visual of this. Three hurdles to this, okay? Hurdle number one, distraction. 
You and I have jumpy minds, this is a human thing. The minute you sit down, quiet yourself, and you kind of shut up, is when the mind starts to go, oh, I need to pick up milk on the way home from church, and my son has a jazz band on Wednesday night, I need to make sure I clear my schedule, and oh, it's Valentine's Day next week, and I haven't even thought about that. That's a little fair warning for all of you men out there. I just wanted, this isn't, uh, it doesn't mean you're bad at this, it just means you're human, Okay. And, and the idea being, your mind will wander every time it does, without beating yourself up about it, just gently return your focus. I think it's, oh, I'm going to freak, oh, Keating, author, anyway, uh, what he said is, if your mind gets distracted a thousand times in ten minutes of prayer, he said, it's just ten, uh, it's just a thousand opportunities for you to come back to God. I thought, there's a glasses half full approach to this whole thing. So distraction is hurdle number one. Hurdle number two is Hurry. Again, we live in this productivity-driven culture, right? Uh, time is money. Money is God. We fill every crack and crevice of our spare time with kind of entertainment and other distractions and busyness. And this sense of sitting in an unhurried way with somebody, it feels so unproductive. Like, we, we, we look at this and we go, so what are you getting out of this? I love this. Thanks for being here. It's why I wanted the visual. Like, am I doing this right? What am I getting out of this? But what if the goal is just the person? If the goal is just being with somebody, you're getting, but it's not, you can't, you can't weigh and you can't quantify it in the same way. So you and I have to get past that hurdle as well. The third one, the third hurdle, by the way, is fear. And that'll sound odd. I am convinced that most of us carry a tremendous amount of pain, shame, and guilt uh, from failure, from mistakes that we've made, from hurts that have happened to us, I, I pressure and expectations that we have or that we're trying to live up to that others have. And, and we run from it through most of our day and we find ways to distract ourselves from it. And we could talk about like busyness and workaholism and food and shopping and entertainment and a thousand culturally acceptable kind of distractions that we can run to. Some of you actually will know what I'm talking about when I suggest for some of you the worst minutes of your day are when your head has to hit the pillow at night with no distractions before you fall asleep. It's the one spot you cannot turn those voices off that tell you how, you know, how unfaithful a spouse you are or how, you know, not as invested a parent as you should be or how disobedient, you know, like the struggles you have in your life sinfully. If, by the way, even for a couple to do this, if you're harboring stuff, if you're hiding stuff, if deep in your heart it's like, if she knew, she, this becomes a really threatening exercise because it's what you're thinking about the whole time. Now, if you do this with, this is why, if you do this in God's presence, friends, he knows everything. Thoughts, selfish motives, sinful habits that you're hiding, it's all on the table, and it's in silence. It's not that it's news to God, but it's where it comes up in our hearts and lives. And it's deeply uncomfortable. I'm convinced one of the reasons we don't do this is actually because of fear. And so I'm just tabling that. Now, these are places God wants to bring. Healing, forgiveness, wholeness. He wants to do good news work in these areas. But you and I have to be willing to actually be honest about it and invite him into those areas. That's the challenge of this. Let's give our friends a round of applause. Thank you so much for being good sports this morning. I wanted to give you a visual because as we just ask, what would it mean to direct the gaze of your heart and the thoughts of your mind in God's direction? In many respects, it's doing the same thing in silence, but I'm envisioning that I'm with God. Now, I'll give you a handful of ways that you can do this. So here's the challenge for this week. It's, in some ways, it's not complex. It's simple. This exercise is simple. doesn't mean it's easy. So whatever your prayer rhythm is, my encouragement is that you consider adding three to five minutes of silence where you will choose not to fill the space with words. That may be too long for you. If one to two minutes is where you're at, let's go with that. It's fine. Be, uh, work with where you're at, not, where, not with where you wish you were, Okay. Add a time of silence into your prayer routine. Uh, 
distractions. I mean, obviously, you need to find ways to minimize that. If the television is on or your cell phone is beside you. This is not helpful. Help yourself. So minimize distractions. The more important piece for us, actually, is how do you and I help focus and orient the gaze of our heart and the thoughts of our mind? Three ideas. Scripture is a classic for this. Find one passage that you will keep coming back to. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack no good thing. Uh, just an example. We talk often about God's self-disclosure statement in Exodus, right? Where he's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Like you could pick one of those compassionate and gracious. Just let that be what helps guide and bring your thoughts and your attention back if and when you're wandering. So scripture is classic for this. Some of you are oriented naturally that you just feel God's presence and it's as if you see his face when you look at creation. So our weather is cooperating. If that means you need to go for a walk by the river, uh, some of you will actually prefer to walk out into the backyard in the evening for three minutes and stare up at the, at the star-filled sky. It's just that is where God's power and his majesty washes over you. Great. Use that as your, as your prayer time and allow that to be something that just reminds you of his power and of the scope of what he's created and that he knows and has created you too. And for others, you may find a symbol, like a picture, a portrait, an idea. This is where if you have like a wooden, like a small wooden cross or a picture of it, just one example. That, like, listen, there's a reason why most churches and ours as well, has a large wooden cross front and center. It, it, I don't know if there's a more powerful symbol when you start to actually let it fill your heart and your mind with what this actually meant for Jesus of God's self-giving and sacrificial love. It's powerful as a symbol that continues to draw the attention of the mind and the gaze of the heart back. So pick something that you'll focus on. And then my encouragement for those minutes, you can set a timer, just sit with God. Look at God. Allow God to see you. And then you can ask. Are, maybe there will be areas of your life you need to yield, things you need to accept. Maybe you will simply rest in God's love. And you'll finish and you'll go, did that work? Did I do it right? That seems so horribly unproductive. And like Sabbath, you may discover, in fact, it would be my hope. I'll dabble with this with you too, by the way. This is foreign to me too. Um, but I wonder if you and I will discover something we deeply need. Or at least that, that would be my hope. We need to move to conclusion this morning. Yeah, different expressions of prayer. By the way, the whole theory or the whole idea behind apprenticing is <laughs> you don't need to be good at these. The, 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 we're assuming we're not good at these. That's why we get to dabble and experiment and, and try some new things. And some you might be like, that was the worst experience ever. I'll never go back to that. Blessings, uh, right? And, and my hope is for some of you, it's like, wow, that was more meaningful than I thought. Uh, so far for me, actually, using scripted prayer has been far more meaningful than I thought. I'm, I'm starting to use that more often. I'll close with this. Billy Graham, towards the end of his life, well-known preacher and evangelist, said the following, if I had it to do again, I would spend more time in meditation and prayer. I found myself thinking that, I wonder if this is a little bit of what that Brother Lawrence referred to as practicing the presence of God. How do we live with greater awareness of his presence? A.W. Tozer called it constant conscious communion. That's a tongue twister. But this idea of being present and, and in God's presence and aware of it on more of an ongoing basis. I would argue the Apostle Paul hints at this when he encourages us to pray without ceasing. Does he mean fill every waking minute of your life with words? That's the goal? I hope not. I think Jesus hints at this when he encourages us to abide in him. What does it mean to rest in God's presence? I hope we've given you some ideas that you can stretch yourselves with. And uh, the, the goal, by the way, next Sunday is that I'm recruiting a panel of about four people who have been willing to be guinea pigs and experiment with this over the last four weeks. And we'll debrief with them a little bit on stage and so we can learn from each other's experience. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Thank you for the permission we have to approach your presence because of your son, Jesus. And thank you that through the gift of your Holy Spirit, we can behold you. Yes, it's not direct, but we can behold the beauty and the presence 
the glory of God and that you have a heart that, that has our best interests uh, in mind and that your heartbeat is that our lives would conform more and more to the image of you, to the image of your son. It's simple, but it's not easy. And our, our pride and our selfishness are those pieces, and even our busyness are, are get in the way of this. And so uh, in the week ahead, will you give us uh, a sense of your image? May we know of your great delight in us. And may we find places and pockets to pause, to reflect, and to just abide with you, trusting that this does an amazing work in our hearts and our lives over time. We are what we direct the gaze of our heart and the thoughts of our mind towards. Meet us in these places. May we discover fresh ways um, of being with you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.